some some days when I wake up and I see these cascading liquidations and like a billion dollars is wiped out and I see the price tank, you know, I look at the chart and like part of me is I'm like, okay, great. Well, you know, I've got some invoices coming and everything. But the other part that all this like vitriol in the back of my brain, I'm like, you fucking degenerate losers. I hope you all get liquidated and wiped out. You deserve this. Yeah. Like, and so you like, you want it. You're like, yeah, just dump, wipe them out. Fucking get out of here with that. Cause this is the fiat mentality that we're trying to get away from and if if we need to wipe out a bunch of idiots that are are picking up pennies in front of a fucking steamroller so be it good riddance get the fuck out of here this is the blue collar bitcoin podcast a show where average joe firefighters explore the most important monetary technology of the 21st century we talk bitcoin we talk finance and we talk shit. Greetings, everybody, and welcome back in for another rendition of the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast. This week, Josh and myself, Dan, had a wonderfully productive conversation with Ben, aka BTC Sessions. Sessions provides some of the best education material in all of Bitcoin. His YouTube channel covers it all including wallets, hardware, security, exchanges, and much, much more. He also hosts weekly panel discussions titled Why Are We Bullish, where he brings on some of the best thought leaders in the space. Ben's material is one of the primary resources Josh and I use when learning and exploring on the tech side of Bitcoin. If you're not subscribed to his channel, you need to be. This was a wide-ranging and meandering discussion covering topics such as the current macroeconomic backdrop, suggestions for Bitcoin self-custody, common mistakes Bitcoiners make, multi-sig options including the pros and cons of companies like Unchained and Casa, Bitcoin dips and sell-offs, doing butt stuff with your Bitcoin, and much, much more. You can follow BTC Sessions on Twitter at BTC Sessions, and links to his YouTube page and website are below in the show notes. To support our show, you can check out the support section down in the show notes. We are active on Twitter at blue underscore collar BTC. And as always, if you're liking our content, subscribing, liking, and leaving us a review is much appreciated. Alrighty, plebs, enjoy this conversation with BTC Sessions. All views and language expressed by the hosts and guests in this podcast are solely their personal opinions and do not reflect their employers or organizations they are associated with. Do not treat any of the content in this podcast as investment advice or as an inducement to follow a particular strategy. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Ben, welcome to the show. How are uh, things in the Great White North there? Uh, chilly, but good. Uh, having to have, you know, gear enough for Christmas and... Uh... Yeah, uh, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. You guys getting the snow piled on yet up there? It's not too bad. It's just the the transition. I mean, like where I am, it you can get quite the swings in temperature. Like our summers can be, you know, 30, 30 something degrees, sometimes even high 30s uh, Celsius. I don't even know what that is. Oh, no, no, I'm thinking Fahrenheit. I'm like, a, we're geez. nowhere near smart enough to make that conversion on the fly. Yeah, man. we're not. Yeah, but regardless, now. we can get we can get down to like, I think the the coldest temperature I ever felt was negative fifty degrees Celsius. Um, you could you could spit and it freezes before it hits the ground. <laughs> so you know, you know. <sighs> I was thinking like, so you're seeing you on my computer screen right now. is a little weird, little surreal, Ben, because I've spent so many hours with you on my screen with hardware devices strewn about in front of me that pardon me if I'm just staring at the screen because I'm not used to interacting with you on the computer. I'm used to just listening. It's so funny. You can, you can, you know, pull out those hardware wallets right now. Wait, okay. How do I go about doing you can actually get an answer instead of screaming at yeah. your screen if I miss something? Your tutorials are incredibly good. They are my go-to. Um, anytime I'm setting something up, I'm confused. You've held my hand through several different devices, through multi-sig, through Sparrow setup. Uh, the list could go on for us. So we appreciate all of the content you are putting out into the pleb space. Damn, thank you. It's, it's flattering. 
we're just going to get a free hour and a half lesson on multi-sig here. Like, we'll we'll get our devices <laughs> out. You just walk us there through we everything because we just didn't want to pay to have to have you, yeah. you know, do yeah, it this, for us. That so makes this sense. is just a lot easier for us. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for the the kind words. I uh, I do appreciate it. And it's uh it's odd having, you know, people like recognize or or, or say that they've watched uh because it was just you know, you you, you create a, a channel and you start pumping out content and for a long time like nobody cares. And then it's it's weird when you get that first handful of people that are like, "Oh yeah, I've seen something you've done." And you're like, "Really? Have you?" <laughs> I think the video tutorials for me, not to, there's a lot of great written tutorials as well, but there's something extra warm and fuzzy about a video tutorial, watching somebody actually make the moves you're about to make. Cause there's just this inherent disposition to be overwhelmed with a lot of this stuff when you're new in the space. Yeah. And so to actually be handheld through the exact steps, open it you know, turn it on, mm -hmm. you know, from square one in a 45 minute to hour long tutorial, at least for me has been super beneficial. This is exactly what I was missing when I, when I got into Bitcoin and, and kind of the impetus for creating the channel was I, you know, I started dabbling in Bitcoin. I was like, okay, great. There's gotta be, you know, YouTube has a ton of stuff. There's gotta be, you know, how do I set up a wallet or something? And, and there just wasn't a lot. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I have to muddle through this myself. And so after a couple of years of messing around, I was like, well, I'll just, I guess I'll just do it because <laughs> nobody has yet. What the fuck is in the air up in Canada, man? I mean, there's so many prolific Bitcoiners like Foss, Booth, U, Valis, NVK, Wealth Theory. I'm only hitting the tip. What, what is going on up there? I don't know. Maybe it's a, a, a direct pushback to our existing government. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just inflation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, <laughs> there's plenty of that going around. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Pierre is, is it will be the least surprising thing of all time when he comes out as a Bitcoiner. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> that video, Dan and I both cracked up at where we were working together, watching that video over and over, just dying as the Jeopardy music is playing. And he's sitting there for two to three minutes waiting for these guys to respond in some way. And they stonewall and stonewall to the point where it's embarrassing. And then the the, the remote guy comes on and he's like, uh, well, I can give you some technical background on how this works. And then it completely avoids the question. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> This yeah, is literally every, this is every interaction with him asking for basic numbers and, and basic uh, like responses every time he asks the government of anything. So how are we affording, like what, where does the money come from or <laughs> what did this even cost? And the, the, this is always the response is, well, we believe in bringing people together and that we are all part of one happy fit. Like that's basically yeah. the responses that you get here. And he's like, was it the tooth fairy? Uh, the money tree? Yeah. Like that, just killing it. <laughs> yeah. For those that are uh, lost here, we're talking about Pierre Poliev. I think I probably yeah, pronounce his name. Poliev. Who in the video we're referencing, he asks... 10 members of, I believe, what your fi a finance committee up there, like where this $7 billion for this spending spree is coming from, nobody can answer for several minutes. And then I think the answer that's eventually given is something like it fits into the broader macroeconomic framework or something like that. And yeah. I mean, think about it. if you're getting asked that question, right? You sit on this committee and this dude asks you, so where does the $7 billion come from? Can you imagine if the response was, well, the, it just debt that gets monetized. We just, we essentially just print the money is the simplest explanation. You yeah. got any other questions, yeah. Pierre? <laughs> like, can you imagine the, yeah. it's, it's, everyone knows the answer. Nobody yeah. can say the answer. See, at least if they would say it, I would respect the, the, the bluntness of the answer and, and like just the, the, how being real with people and saying like, well, it's, this is, this is how it is. It, this is how we do it, I guess. It, it surprised yeah. me that they didn't come up with some jargon in order to like, kind of like, you know, Powell or, or Bernanke has done and Yellen did like call it quantitative easing or call it, you know, some technical yeah. jargon that most people are going to get glassy eyed and they're going to not want to hear anymore. They just assume that these PhDs know what they're doing and they're taking care of everything for yeah. them. But not even yeah. that, not even 
Not even some yeah. technical well, BS. I mean, they're responsive. It fits into the broader macroeconomic framework for this government <laughs> is true because that broad <laughs> macroeconomic framework is print the damn money. Like yes, that's, that's what they got, right? We were giving this explanation at the firehouse when we were playing the video to another member of our agency. And we used, a, we used an example from our uh, union and we said, so basically this is what happens. They're like, so where does this, where does this money come from? You know, just asking the genuine question. We're like, all right, so imagine the executive board of the union just decides they're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars and they mm -hmm. create a loan that's then purchased by the treasurer of the union and printed out. Like, it's like people, when you go through exactly how it's happening, but just put different names on it, people are like, wait, that's, that can't be true. That's not actually what's going on. Yeah. Wait, you mean nothing is backing the money? It's just like an elaborate Ponzi scheme. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. I was listening to a podcast earlier today where they were talking about the same exact situation. This phenomena happened in France in uh, the 1600s. John Law was the guy who was the prime minister or the finance minister at the time in France. And he was at the same time pulling this giant Ponzi scheme of the Mississippi uh, land company or whatever they called it. It was the same exact thing. It was monetizing the debt from this company that was going on in the, the new world and then monetizing it and flipping it back over to sell its stock. So basically propping itself up with, its, with itself, a giant Ponzi scheme. And yeah. this kind of stuff has perpetuated itself through history. And it's not a new phenomenon. It'll, it'll, uh, it'll, un it'll unwind itself eventually. Yeah. Well, I mean, shit always hits the fan eventually, right? It's, it's just as people realize that there's, there's no value there and they, they, they question it. Um, it, it just unravels. Right. And, and, and you see that today, you see people, you see the odd person I've up until recently, I'd never spoken to my, my friends and family about inflation in terms of them bringing it up being like oh god stuff's expensive and oh god how do they print so much money and it doesn't that doesn't make sense and how can they do that and you know people are are at least seeing the cracks now they may not fully understand but but they they see that something's wrong i think they're i think people are feeling it for the first time yeah albeit yeah. in small doses i think it's not just a word now. It's something they experience at the grocery store or when they go buy a used car or go to the gas pump or look for a home. Um, and the message we're getting out is that's not changing anytime soon. Like to distill a lot of these more complicated, high level macroeconomic framework themes we just hit on, the message is life is going to get more expensive. If you're not holding hard assets, the hamster wheel is speeding up, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. And there aren't many good answers. Like there is almost nowhere to hide other than this protocol in yeah. our humble opinion. Yeah. Scary. And I worry for friends and family. Now I, I, you know, I've done my best to kind of clue people into, to, to Bitcoin and, and, and get them down that path. And, you know, I have friends and family that own Bitcoin and everything. Um, but and, and I'm thankful for that because especially like my parents, I don't know how they would make retirement without it. Uh, but that being said, I worry that <laughs> I, I worry that they aren't exposed enough. Mm. I were, you know, it's, and which to a normie on the outside looking in is like, that sounds insane to me. But to me, the exposure that people have to the fiat system right now is insane to me. And it's going to get difficult yeah. uh in the uh, throughout the 2020s no doubt think about the fact that if you have money in a bank in the inflationary future we're moving into at a relatively quick pace if you're exposed to lending money if you're a lender in any way you're gonna lose because you're yeah. you know what i mean like you're just gonna get washed out by the the intake you're getting with this small uh, rate of your savings account paying you 0.02 percent versus the inflation rate of six to ten percent you're getting crushed. But even if you have money sitting in the bank, you're effectively a lender because that money's getting diminished. Or if you're paying off your house as quick as you can, you're going to get completely washed away by this inflation. Like the crazy thing is, is that the most irresponsible thing you can do traditionally is to carry as much debt as you can, you know, and buy, you know, I'm not saying you should go buy frivolous things, but you should buy hard, good assets. I think we would all agree. But 
it seems irresponsible to go take loans and to, you know, reinvest the money into things that you think are going to be more valuable that are hard assets. But that's almost exactly the thing you need to be doing to protect yourself these days. The, the yeah. seemingly irresponsible. Did, did you guys see, there's an article the other day, I think it was CNBC or Bloomberg. Actually, I think I'm pretty sure it was Bloomberg, but they released an article that was effectively in the in the face of inflation. We've got advice from Argentinians on how to handle it. <laughs> yeah, we and saw it was this. like saw a, this. <laughs> this is insane. Like the one of the first things, uh, the first piece of advice they said is spend your paycheck immediately in full. <laughs> was one of the great was one of the pieces of it, which I mean. Yeah, you don't you don't want to hang on to the dollars, but like it it's just seeing that in print as a you know adversarial position uh, against uh, the current monetary environment is is pretty jarring. It is. I, I feel it makes you. It's just third world country stuff. You know, like you think Zimbabwe, you think Argentina, you think the Weimar Republic. When you see that stuff, you don't think modern day. First world countries. Yeah. yeah. You don't think the USA coming from Bloomberg. Like right. That's, yeah. that's insane. It is it crazy. Is. I, I saw you tweeted something out or today, I think it was, you were talking about the changing narrative on inflation, how <laughs> oh God, yeah. essentially the words that are being used, like even in the last 18 months have gone down a slippery slope. We went from yeah. l- inflation is low to it's transitory. Now it's a good thing. Yeah. Well, did you see the latest one? From it was like a, I think I think this was the CNBC one, but it was like an outline of, of inflation, and the the general sentiment of the article was, well, inflation's only bad if if we think about it and expect it to continue to go on. So basically, like bl- placing the blame on us for uh for trying to protect ourselves from inflation uh, by actually acting to to preserve our our purchasing power. Um, and so, you know, in a roundabout way, first of all, there was no inflation, <laughs> then inflation was low, then it was transitory, then it was good. And now it's bad, but it's your fault. So, yeah. you know, th- that's the slope that we're on. Yeah. It's gaslighting, classic gaslighting. And yeah. now we're in the yeah. middle of this, at least in this country, we're in the middle of this giant costume party where Jerome Powell is pretending as though he's going to be a hard ass. And so Josh and I actually... The other day. So we work at the same department, but we were on different shifts. And we had a rare day where I was on overtime. We were on the ambulance together. We rotate apparatus. So one day you're on the fire truck, next day you're on the ambulance. We're firefighter paramedics. So this day on the ambulance, I shit you not, I bet we talked about Bitcoin for as much as this is going to surprise our audience. We probably talked about Bitcoin for 12 out of the 24 hours. But one of <laughs> one of the exercises we did in the kitchen <laughs> with a little gallery was we basically just worked through like what what happens if they actually did get in this game of chicken, right, with the global economy and they decided to get hit by the car, basically. Like what what happens if what happens if they legitimately and tangibly totally tighten up, right? And rates do go up more than just 10, you know, basis points, they go up full percentage points and they start climbing. It's kind of an interesting exercise to, to go through. And it leads to the various, uh, very obvious mathematical conclusion of like, well, you have sovereign nation state default. Like there is yeah. no, there is no the whole world would be on fire. Yeah. yeah you can everything. play a game maybe within a, a band. Like I have a buddy that trades bonds for a living and I was just bouncing ideas off him. Like, Hey, here's kind of my thesis. You know, we've had a 10 year treasury that's gone from say low teens to a percent and a half more recently. Like how high could this thing possibly go? And he said, like, it's, it's virtually physically impossible for the 10 year treasury to ever go over four and a half percent again. So maybe we just play this game in low bandwidth. But if you, if you are fed chairman or whatever the equivalent is in Canada, like you have to put this costume on. Like, there's no other option. You have to pretend like you're going to try to have the ball bounce off the floor back towards the ceiling. I'm just picturing that yeah. meme of somebody putting on the red nose, putting on the makeup, putting on the hair, <laughs> and then saying, I'm going to raise interest rates. Head out in front of the people, <laughs> yeah. Jerome. You got to. You know, someone just pushes it on on stage. Yeah. it's I, I don't see how they can 
sustainably do it. Cause I mean, just everything starts to crack if, if you're too hard line about it. And, and realistically what we probably see is just a maybe slightly more violent version of, of what happened when they tried to, when they tried to taper last time, right? Yeah, like 2018, the overnight, right? yeah, the overnight repo market started imploding. Like all, all this shit started going sideways and they're like, Oh, never mind. No, nope. I wonder though, Whoops. I, because they, right now they have the last time they tried to do this, they didn't have the specter of real inflation showing up at all. So now they have yeah. these two boogeymen that they have to kind of compromise between. Mm -hmm. We have inflation, which is bad. Everybody's recognizing this is the bad thing. And we have the other possibility of shit tanking the entire market over a course yeah. of a few weeks or something. I think they might be less sensitive about market corrections. Like maybe they're not going to panic at 10%. It might take 20% for them to decide mm -hmm. to throw in the towel and stop. But I I don't know. Like, it, there's just no way for them to play this tightrope. It's just so, so finely strung at this point that it's, um, it'll be interesting it's like, to watch. It's like watching that. It's more like watching, uh, what's the, is it Pong? The, like, the game where the ball starts, <laughs> the two paddles either way going, and it's, and the ball is speeding up. It's just going yeah. between like crash all the markets or massive inflation and it's going quicker and quicker. And you're like, which way is it going to go? Who's going to lose? Yeah. I mean, but, but if, yeah, if we game it out though, like I, I'd have to think, I mean, they're the choosing inflation in the long run is going to have to be the way they go. They just, it just seems no like they don't have a choice. I think there's going to be a lot of decoys short term. Like you look at, you look at stimulus during COVID, you look at what I think is the inevitable move towards UBI. Although that's obviously not going to help the inflation narrative, it's going to keep the townspeople from burning them at the stake, right? Yeah. And so I think that can be kind of the decoy for a while. But what's so fascinating when you think about the Cantillon effect, and I tweeted something out about this the other day, was like, just do some napkin math here. So I think my tweet was something to the effect of like, the, th the first three stimulus packages here in the United States amounted to $388 billion, okay? Currently, the Fed is stepping into the market at a clip of $120 billion a month. And since 2008, the Fed's balance sheet has gone up $8,000 billion. So it really is a decoy, <laughs> right? But it's a decoy yeah. that works because when people get $300 in their checking account, you who I'm going to go buy a vacuum. Everything's okay, you know? And yeah. I at least behaviorally and socially in society, I think that's going to buy them some time, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. The, it, imagine, because r really, money is just meant to be an aggregate representation of all the goods and services available in, in an, an economy, right? If, if instead of a number in your bank account being just like the number of dollars that you have, if instead that number was the percentage of the economy that you mm. own, can you imagine people watching their numbers drop? How insane that would be if that was the number that you saw reflected That's a really in good your way portfolio. To think about it. That's yeah. a great it's, way to think about it. It's it would there there would be such an upheaval because you'd get your stimmy and you'd be like, fucking great. And then you just see your mm -hmm. your numbers cratering because they're just printing trillions. And you're like, oh wait, uh, my percentage of the stuff is just cratering and they're pretending like they're doing me a favor. Fuck this. Let's burn down some buildings. Like that, <laughs> that would be that would be their sentiment. Cause people would get an accurate depiction of what's happening. Because when they print money and they send you that stimmy, <laughs> they're still decreasing your percentage of what you own. Absolutely. And then juxtapose that with the Bitcoin protocol. We're going back to basics yeah. and fundamentals here, but it's what's completely remarkable about this network is every single sat you stack you have virtual assurance that you have that stake in the network forever it's yeah. it's incredible yeah. the only time that number goes down is on your own accord if you make a mistake and lose some if you make a purchase if you are not creating more value than you're expending then that's when the number goes down. And so people would start actually in, in that world, you can calculate what percentage of the economy you are and whether or not that number is going up. And there's not this game of, well, the numbers in my account are going up, but what does that mean in terms of the economy? 
like you just said, yeah. and that's a really cool way to enumerate it. If you're not providing more value to the world than you're consuming, it's obviously shown in that percentage of stakeholdership in the protocol. Whereas with mm -hmm. dollars, like stimmies, you're not creating any value. Like the government printing yeah. money, everyone who understands how basic ec economics works, there's no value creation there. You're simply just carving the pizza into tinier slices and everyone is still sharing the same amount. But this yeah. fundamental understanding is lost on so many people. And if it was truly understood, like there would be, there'd be a lot of cars burning. <laughs> Uh, the un the unfortunate reality and the reason the three of us are doing what we're doing is it takes a long time to walk people through what's actually at play. Um, I mean, oh, we, yeah. we work with a lot of people that are watching their retirement balances, thinking that they are getting closer to retirement. Like that's the simple like brass tacks way to put it. Like, oh, I am yeah. accumulating wealth such that I may be able to move on quicker than I thought or whatever. It's like, no, it's actually not happening that way. But visually, it appears as though that's what's occurring. And it's, it really is insidious and it takes a lot of education to get people up to speed. And there's no yeah. wonder that they've been able to get away with this ruse for so long because so few yeah. people really understand it. And those that do the massive generalization here, but tend to be wealthier and better educated, they are asset mm -hmm. holders and they are benefiting or at least uh, continuing to tread water with this printing, but the middle and lower classes, are getting absolutely decimated by this move and they have a greater propensity statistically to not understand what's at play. Yeah. I would say uh, just as to, to kind of bookend what you're saying, you know, the people that are cluing into this, I would say are actually two polar opposite ends of the spectrum, but we don't see it as much in, in first world nations because the, the most disenfranchised in, Canada and the U S and, and other kind of first world nations, they're not disenfranchised enough mm. to understand. But when you get somewhere like Venezuela and Argentina and places with massive, like hyper inflation, um, where, where they've seen their savings debased into, in, into absolute worthlessness multiple times, they get it. So you get these these polar opposite ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. where like the worst, absolute worst off in the world and the absolute best off in the world, they're the first one that gets it, the first ones that get it, and then it's starting to work its way inwards. Yeah, I think one interesting thing about those that do get it, and I love the point you just made, they've had previous examples of escaping into harder assets, right? So if you yeah. live in a country that's hyperinflated before, you've escaped into, say, the U.S. dollar. So needing to yeah. move your nest egg into another monetary technology is something they're accustomed to, them or their parents have seen. If you live in the United States, you've never gone through this process. So for them, the move from their currency to another currency, that being Bitcoin, is much more in the forefront of mind because they've had those educational experiences in the past of moving their, their nest egg from one area to another. Yeah, 100%. Ben, did you see uh, earlier today, there was a tweet by Pish where he kind of outlined, did you see these charts that he made? They're brilliant. I did not yet. I, I, I bookmarked this. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, check it out. But one of the most poignant charts I think is for people that like Dan was speaking about people that are retirees that are watching their, their nest egg grow by say 20 to 30% this year with the S and P 500 thinking they're making it, you know, doing really well. If you normalize all of this for the M2 money supply over the last 10 years, it's up 6.9% over the last the S&P 500 over the last 10 years, if normalized with the percentage of money that's been created over that same period of time. This is yeah. incredibly insane to like really see it spelled out this way. The way I love the way that he took all of these data points and can coalesce them all into this awesome chart that <laughs> looks completely the opposite of what you see when you look at a, a typical S&P 500 chart that everyone is, you know, seeing up to the right. And this is yeah. down and right pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the best threads I've ever seen on Twitter, by the it way, is. out of Pish. Dude yeah. just keeps it's, delivering. Yeah, he well, he has that framework in his mind where uh, he he can really distill it down to to what's actually happening globally and and um yeah, it's it's very stark when you compare that to to what 
is fed to you every day and and you know the charts that you're used to seeing of oh yeah you know you you put it in the stock market because you know it always goes up over time it's just uh you know there's volatility and everything but you know if you park it there then in the long run you'll be okay uh yeah how are you the funny thing about all of this too is like this narrative shift for for kind of typical people like us like you look at these things and you see uh you know the cpi being what it is it's a basket of things that they make up basically and they have adjustments the unemployment numbers the adjustments they make to that all of these things i mean people are losing faith in these institutions in a massive way because they're being lied to on a on a grand scale and when they actually look into the numbers for themselves and they understand that this is all nonsense really like this is just an institutional breakdown of trust i think that we're seeing play out on a grand scale for the world and it's it's gonna it, it's just kind of scary to watch that play out because it, it it can lead to some darker stuff in the longer term or even the shorter term as people kind of come to that realization it's gonna be a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow um realizing that kind of the 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 fundamental economic lessons that they were taught if they were even taught any but those that were taught were were taught some lessons that were incredibly uh at the very least misleading and um yeah i mean it's not easy to learn that your entire monetary system and and the the unit of measurement that you use to kind of discern value is broken beyond repair. Yeah, that's a, that's a fairly, uh, fundamental thing. That's a, that's a rug that's squarely beneath you. That's getting yanked pretty hard. Yeah. You just break absolutely. that news. Isn't all that comfortable, <laughs> but Hey, we got Bitcoin. So, yep. you know, <laughs> yeah, we do. This thing's pretty freaking special. Um, walk us through your Bitcoin backstory, your journey into the seat yeah. you sit in today with those nice lights behind you and <laughs> and a block clock. Yeah, uh, we're envious of the yeah, block I got, clock. I got, I got lots of. You know, you've made it in Bitcoin when you have me. a block clock. Yeah, Dan and I don't deserve a block clock. <laughs> we're actually yet. talking to NVK in January. <laughs> Maybe we'll make oh, our good. poor pleb play like beforehand. We'll be like, all right, here's the deal. You're on here because we want a couple block clocks. Yeah, there it's it is pretty awesome. I I love having this thing behind me. I think I got to put in uh, right now. I just have it mo uh, alternating between uh, the the block number, Moscow time, and the USD price. Uh, but I think maybe I'll put in a couple other things there. I think there's a couple other new metrics that I like that I have to throw in. But um, yeah, I, I, so I. I guess I, I kind of noticed Bitcoin a couple of times through 2013, like across my radar, just seeing, you know, typical number go up type articles pop up. And, and I had always been, you know, I was, I was interested in certain types of technologies. I, I won't say that I was super techie, but like, I, I also did things like I'd buy a MacBook and I'd swap out the hard drive and the RAM to upgrade it. And then I'd flip it. <laughs> so like I'd buy a used MacBook and like put in slightly better parts. And then because people were like, Ooh, MacBook, I'd be able to sell it for like substantially more because most people think I got to go to the Apple store to get this <laughs> upgrade. So yeah. I did things like that, but that was like as techie as I kind of got, which, you know, if you can pop in a Nintendo cartridge, you're probably fine there. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> So, so I, I saw Bitcoin a few times through 2013. Every time I thought I missed the boat because it was like, oh, I see it in two digit price range. Then it's over a hundred bucks, missed the boat. Then it's over a thousand bucks. Holy crap, I missed the boat. But around kind of the peak of that, that um, bubble in 2013, I kind of thought, well, there's, there's either something going on here or it's like a, a big scam. So I started doing some reading. I tried to take in everything that I could. I spent probably two, two or three months just trying to understand what the hell was going on. Um, I got comfortable enough where I started dabbling, got a wallet, which at the time is Bitcoin QT. So the equivalent of Bitcoin core today um, and just kind of started experimenting, getting a little bit of Bitcoin um, and just, how to use a wallet. Um, but the, the first time I ever bought that same week 
uh, Mount Gox imploded, the the <laughs> famous Great like timing. massive exchange. Now I I didn't buy on Mount Gox, but like it didn't help that I st- had started talking to my friends about Bitcoin. And then that week they, they see the news and they're like, oh, well, clearly you're an idiot if you bought any of this stuff. Uh, but I understood enough at that point to know, well, this is this was a ba- a poorly run business that had people's funds under their control. It's not Bitcoin itself breaking, uh, contrary to what the news was saying. I, under- I at least understood the difference there. So I just kind of kept chugging along. And after... You know, I was trying to learn. There wasn't a ton of material out there. I'm more of a visual learner. I had wished there were video tutorials out there for me, but it, you know, it was typically like, "Here's a link to a message board where somebody typed it out and explained it." <laughs> I'm like, this is not helping me learn. Um, so I just kind of muddled through things for a couple of years myself, and um, just kind of peripheral to that outside of this i was a i was a performer i had some mild uh video editing skills i was comfortable like on a stage or with a microphone um You're, so what kind I, of performer so i i sang in an acapella group for like a decade i also was a i i used to teach little kids how to break dance for like a decade uh so I a performed singer and a, a break dancer ship. Nice. Yeah, a little, a little bit of a few things, but uh, yeah. So I, I did a lot of different performing and stuff like that. Um, and and I taught, I taught kids how to break dance. So that educational aspect of being able to break down, you know, complex movements, regardless of what you're teaching, as long as you understand the source material, usually you can still break it down in a way that's accessible. So after a couple of years, I was like, I mean, I still don't see very many videos out there explaining this stuff. I guess I'll just start making them. I could probably make them somewhat entertaining to watch and I'll just make a a video a week on whatever the hell I want, whatever I think is useful. And then I just didn't stop. (laughs) So it's been like five and a half years now. Um, I, I, uh, gradually started making more videos. I started doing all kinds of different tutorials, uh, around 2017, 2018, after like very, very liberally kind of dabbling in shit coins, I, I clued into the fact that Bitcoin was, was kind of what made sense. And then I just solely focused on Bitcoin. And, uh, and so I'm very happy with that. And it also kind of focuses my attention on, on using applications and, and creating tutorials around things that are actually important. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of, why the channel is here. And so now I, I do a lot more content than just one a week. I usually do one tutorial, a video, a uh, news video, um, a panel video every Friday. Why are we bullish? And then I do like shorter pieces of content. So I think I'm dropping like six videos a week now. Dang. Wow. That's quite a clip, man. <laughs> How long have you been doing it full time then? Uh, yeah. So it was, it was kind of, my two worlds were colliding, uh, over time. So I, around 20 end of 2017, like very peak of the bull market. Um, I decisively, uh, quit my like dance instructing job, but throughout that whole year, it had, had kind of been overlapping because I was working for Bitcoin related companies like ATM companies and stuff like that. And also doing like admin work for this dance company that does in school residencies, but I just couldn't stop thinking about Bitcoin and surrounding myself with it and doing the channel and working for these companies that I was like, I have to, that old world is, is gone. I can't, I can't focus it on and on it anymore. And I'm doing a disservice to, you know, a, 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 a guy who owns the company that, um, I respect a lot and he, he offered me a, a lot of opportunities and, and it would have been disingenuous to continue on. So I just, you know, I, I ended that um, and wished him all the best and, and thanked him for having me for 10 years, basically. And I said, all right, this is this is life now. Let's figure it out. So I, I worked uh, amongst a, a bunch of different countries over uh, countries, co- companies over the next two to three years. And then in the middle of. 2020 so about a year and a half ago now um turns out i just really hate 
people telling me what to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, I need to make this work. I need to uh, put a con- concerted effort into just doing the channel. So I did. I spent a couple months, figured out what I needed to do, and um, I I went solo. And so I've been running just the channel since summer of 2020. No other job, just just making tutorials and videos. And I would not change a thing. I am so ecstatic doing what I'm doing. I, I've never been more in love with what I get to do every single day. It's incredible. What part of the channel and, and what you put out, do, do, would you say most viewers take for granted? Like what's an aspect of the work that you're like, I know you enjoy it, but you're like, if you guys had any idea how long this <laughs> takes or how hard this is, what is it? It's, um, uh, most people, you know what, most of the comments and, and everything are, are pretty gracious and, and like, holy crap, thank you. And like, if there's anything that was missed, usually the comments are like, oh, hey, there's this thing. And every once in a while, though, I'll get a comment and it'll be like, yo, you left this out. Why is this video still up? Just delete it. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, this video took so fucking long. And just because I missed like one beat on one little thing, I can't I can't go deleting videos and like re-editing and re-uploading and everything. First of all, that kills traffic to the videos that are helpful. Second of all, like the re-editing process, if I could even do it, if I still have the original clips, is just horrendous. So, so stuff like that, I'm like, guys, I'm sorry. There's inevitably there's going to be mistakes. I'm going to misspeak. I'm going to do the best that I can. And if, if it's so out of date that it needs an update, I'll just do a new one. So that's, that's kind of, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. People, uh, people can be pretty rough out there. Not having any idea how much time it takes to do these types of things, you know? Yeah. We just, we've just gotten into, we, uh, we've, uh, we're still a fairly small footprint, but we're gotten large enough where we're getting the occasional hater and, Basically, our response from BCB is we just call them adorable. You're it's adorable. Really, <laughs> it's actually, <laughs> Dan, I forgot to tell team. you that that dude the other day, we had some gold bug guy. His his handle was like gold smith or gold silver. He had some like, whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, is like he was he had some issue with a tweet that we had. And he said, you know, gold is going to last longer than Bitcoin. And I was like, you're right. When, uh, you know, the world's a dead rock, the gold's going to be here and Bitcoin's going to be dead. But it's not going to matter. And uh, he said something else. I just called him adorable. And then he deleted the whole thing. He deleted the whole thread. <laughs> I'm going to have to try it. It, yeah. it works really would, well. There's nothing more scathing from the blue collar Bitcoin Twitter handle than you're adorable. You heard it here. Folks. <laughs> yeah, it's um, the only other thing that I I have no time for is when is when somebody starts commenting and saying like, oh, you know, this coin and that coin are better. And like, why are you messing around? And like, you know, like some of the ESG stuff and, you know, the typical Bitcoin FUD points and, you know, this is, this is going to zero or, you know, this is, it, it can be hacked or just like, just the bullshit where it's like, you haven't taken more than two seconds of thought inside your own head, let alone looking elsewhere where for answers to just like, make up some bullshit argument as to why it doesn't work. And then dropping that comment on my YouTube channel. I'm like, no, (laughs) yeah, I don't have time for that. I think what's interesting when you take on the mantle of attempting to educate in this space is that like we have a heart to help educate. We're passionate, Mm -hmm. very passionate about getting through to our demographic in particular, but all people. But I think our vision and mission is like, Hey, if we can be a mouthpiece for the middle class and average wage earner about how important this network is, that's what we're here to do. So we want to do what we can to bring people up to speed. But at the same time, when you're to get involved in this space requires some self-ownership. And I think the longer we've been in it, we are absolutely willing to hold hands if the person next to us is willing to take steps, but we're not going to drag anyone along with us. You have to yeah. own this yourself. You have to learn this yourself. This is where you come in handy sessions because <laughs> we're, we're getting questions frequently. Which hardware wallet? What's multi-sig? How do I do this, that, and the other thing? 
we're, we're always our go-to response. The two of us is like, we're here for any questions, like go watch this video, try it yourself with a small amount of Bitcoin, because you have to put hands on keys yeah. to really be self-sovereign when it comes to Bitcoin. There's nobody that's going to be able to do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I like your point of, you know, you're not going to drag somebody through this. And, and so that's, that tends to be my approach. And so when I'm talking about those types of comments of, of, of whatever it may be, especially the ones that are like, oh, this is, this is a scam or whatever. I don't have time for that kind of stuff because I'm, I'm not here to debate you on whether or not Bitcoin is legitimate, right? I'm here to, if, if you're curious, I'm here to help you in that process of how do you use it? What is it? You know, all of those questions that you get when you're interested enough to want to know, but I'm like, I'm not going to be kicking in people's doors saying you have to learn about this. This is, you need to know right now. And, you know, I, I'm not going to have those debates of, of the value proposition of Bitcoin with people. I'm going to let them come to that conclusion of this is interesting and I want to know more about it. And then when they're, they're ready for that, great, here's a ton of stuff and you can start learning, but you know, I'm, I'm not here to, to argue with some, some person that, that doesn't believe that Bitcoin is, is worth their time. Ben is, um, we, we've got quite a few people that listen that, uh, are new to this, that are probably just maybe buying the first time on Coinbase or strike maybe. Mm -hmm. So when you hear somebody who's brand new to the space, what would be your recommendations for them to, first of all, get their money off of the exchange and uh, just first simple steps to get their money held themselves and be sovereign? What would be uh, yeah. your thoughts? So uh, the typical trajectory that I send people on is, number one, obviously, just get off zero, right? Own some Bitcoin. That's, that's the obvious step one. Step two is is learn how a wallet works and how to get your own Bitcoin into it. So get some Bitcoin off the exchange, even if it's a small amount, as you're learning how to do that. Um, a lot of times they'll send people to Blue Wallet or or maybe Moon, uh, just because, it's, uh, because it does have lightning and that can be a thing that we talk about down the line. Um, but, you know, I, I want them to, to get a, a mobile wallet and just, just try that out, get some Bitcoin into it. And then... Okay, it's time for hardware because if you, st you know, once you get down that rabbit hole and you start looking at Bitcoin and you own some Bitcoin and you put it in your own wallet, odds are you're probably going to start stacking some more sats. And so then I, then I start pointing them towards, okay, well, here's the different kinds of, of hardware wallets. And then depending on the person, I may funnel them one way or another, um, depending on how technically savvy they are, how timid they may be. Um, and what I think is a best fit for them. And that's a very kind of personal thing because some people will like some aspects of it and some people won't. And some people want to get into the weeds, they don't. But my typical trajectory, get off zero, get off the exchange and get it into cold storage. Once you're there, there's a whole plethora of other things that you can start diving into. You can start diving into um, Lightning Network. You can start learning about maybe a node if you're, if you, you know, a node is such a, a cool teacher yes, because it is. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so um, easy so, where uh, we are pushing people here. Like you can do the node thing. Like if you consider yourself yeah. a, a legitimate Bitcoiner, you think this thing's a big deal. You have a position that is meaningful to you run yeah. a freaking node. Yeah. There's no yeah. excuse anymore either. Uh, a few years ago before Umbral, like it was a pain in the ass to run a node. Yeah. You had to follow someone's yeah. half ass, you know, text file on how to set all this stuff up and good luck that you didn't copy and paste the command exactly right. I, I've been through all that. It was very frustrating. Umbral comes out. I had this disjointed half working node. It would work once in a while whenever it decided to, but Umbral just made it so incredibly easy that it's, it's not excusable anymore. As long as you can afford yeah. to buy the hardware, you need to run one mm -hmm. of these things. Yeah. And it's so cool now because you know, Umbral is incredible. And now you're starting to see others step up and be like, hey, like, I, I don't I don't think anybody has nailed the the user experience like Umbral has. Um, and and a lot of people, 
you know, the, you, you get some pushback from, from, um, you know, some people saying, well, there's trade-offs with how easy it is and everything. Sure. But at the same time, at the same time though, that's why so many people use Umbral because they're like, oh my God, like I was scared before, but when I look at this, it, it looks like something I can use. It looks, there's a, a, a type of familiarity in their kind of like app setup and like go to the app store, download the thing that you want. You're not inundated with a million things that are on your node right off the bat. Um, the, the usability is, is, you know, you can, you can take baby steps and it doesn't look scary out of the box. And I think this is what a lot of wallet, and it's the same with blue wallet, actually, that it's that same feel where I want to add a wallet and it's like its own individual little card. Mm. And it's like, this is this wallet. And then, oh, here's a lightning wallet and you can just swipe between them. And it, there's something intuitive about this kind of like app based looking interface that I think, I think people that push back uh, of, with Umbral success and, and how many people are using it need to look at why, because it, it's the first time, like you guys are saying, where you can tell somebody who's not tech yes. savvy, like this is, this is easy, actually, mm -hmm. you know, you get a, you get an S SD card and you plunk it into this thing and you plug it in. And it's actually like you don't have you're not doing command line, you're not doing it's just working. And once you get somebody down that rabbit hole, even though they may not fully understand what they're doing off the bat in terms of like what's in front of them, you, you then get to explain to them the the power that they wield with yes. with this thing. Right. And that's pretty powerful when when you explain to somebody that there could be you know, the largest companies in Bitcoin and a ton of the miners and all of these people all colluding to change Bitcoin and, and up the issuance and everything like that. And just by running this thing on, on your shelf in your bedroom, you get to say no, you get, you yes. get to say no to them. That's unprecedented. And it, it's like when, if the fed was like, Hey, you know, tough times. We think we need to print three or six trillion dollars, and you, as an individual, got to say, "Nah, not nah. happening, <laughs> not happening." Jay Pal, not in this house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and there is something incredible about that first moment when you see your balance on your cold stored wallet through your own node. That's the first time yes. in your life you're you're seeing yeah. Bitcoin through your own two eyes, and when people get to experience that. I think now, Josh, is a good time to shout out to our buddy Jim, who is taking he's in the, the middle. plunge. He's in the he's, middle of doing it right ooh. now. He's in the middle of doing it. I believe it's sinking to the blockchain. Um, congratulations, Jim. We're yeah. proud of he, you. He actually only texted me once or twice about it, which surprised. I mean, he's playing. It's really, he's trying I told to him it's cool. super easy, but yeah, he's trying to play it cool. He isolated me yesterday on duty too, Josh. So he hit you first, then he hit me second. And yesterday he's like, all right, so I'm I'm trying not to like smother you guys or anything. <laughs> Just like one quick question. Yeah. He's doing great though. I mean, and it and it's like I think he's realizing as he's going through the process. I mean, we're no smarter than him. We're the same, you know, the same dudes. Like we had the same thought of like, wow, this is easier than I thought. I think one angle we bring, Ben, is that like we don't work in the Bitcoin world or the programming world or the tech world. We work in the firefighter world. So as much as certain concepts and devices may seem super energizing and fun to the tech savvy, we have a lens of like what actually has legs. What are people mm -hmm. really going to use? And we understand that some trade-offs exist with something like Umbrella, but these installations are, this UX is just needs to be good for people to yeah. do it. It needs yeah. to be self-explanatory or people just simply won't do it. I mean, the same thing would be true of like a multi-sig. So yeah. yeah, ideally, would we love people to use Sparrow through their own node and have their, you know, whatever we would, but things like, you know, Shamir backup on a Trezor or Seed XOR on a cold card or Unchained Capital, like, yeah, these may not be perfect in, mm -hmm. in some people's minds, but they're steps in the right direction for the average person that just isn't going to take that giant leap. Yeah. It is something very different and very special the first time that you really understand that your node is actually doing all of this for you. It's not Trezor's servers. It's not Ledger's servers. It's your equipment 
measuring and weighing everything for you. It is a very special experience. Yeah, Everyone it's, it's pretty liberating. It's it's definitely liberating and, and exciting the first time you do that. And and you're right, you know, um, there's there's tools that I use that I only recommend to certain people if I feel like they're they're at that point in the rabbit hole where they they understand enough and they're not going to get freaked out by using something. You know, all of those tutorials are are out there for for people to use, but um, you know, if it's a newcomer and you know they just bought some Bitcoin and they're like, "How do I store this and how do I secure it?" You know, that answer for that person is going to be very different than somebody, um, you know, shooting me a DM being like, "Yo, I was using." You know, I, I just set up my own node and, uh, you know, I, I've been playing around with lightning and everything, but I'm curious about multisig. Can you point me in the right direction? Like the, the answer for that person in that context is going to be very different mm. than the noob that just got some for sats sure. onto Blue Wallet the first time. Yeah. Josh, we could almost say that seeing your Bitcoin balance through your own node is Bitcoin wedding night. Like you... <laughs> <laughs> That's when you, you, you consummate the coital, yeah. the coital relationship with your Bitcoin. Yeah. You may have <laughs> yeah. gone, folks. Yeah. You may be at first, second, even third base with your Bitcoin. You haven't gone all the fucking way until you see this yeah. thing routed through your own node, right, Ben? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's like it's like butt stuff. <laughs> yeah, that it is. Maybe multi. That's even more special. Yeah, that's multi sig. Yeah. Multi sig is butt stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and and Lightning Network is is that that quick hand job before <laughs> go, going into work in the morning I, or something. I think we need to keep exploring this. This is really getting better. Yeah, we'll fill this in. <laughs> we'll have this completely filled in by the next time we have you on, Ben. Yeah, uh, yeah, we need. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see people making? You're doing a lot of coaching, a lot of educating. What are some mistakes um, you see? Yeah, I mean, other than the obvious, like diving down into you know different coins and everything and and giving more time to that than is necessary i think i think a lot of people are going to go down that road at least initially but the amount of content in and around why bitcoin uh has grown and and the signal there is pretty strong so if people find their way to it then that kind of sorts itself after a while um i think in general Overcomplication, you know, like you, you can be your own worst enemy. If if you're trying to think like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, if if every new tool you feel like you need to be using it in your Bitcoin arsenal, you're gonna overcomplicate things. Like if you're if you're like, oh, I'm gonna do a multi-sig setup and I'm gonna have all these different devices, each one is going to have different pin numbers, and then I'm going to split the seeds, and also there's going to be a passphrase on top. Very quickly, you have no idea what the fuck you're doing, and you're, there's good luck remembering it, yeah. right? So That's like bringing a third you know, person in the bedroom. Marriage ends yeah. right then. Yeah. <laughs> on that note, you, yeah. you must hear from people once in a while who have fucked up and lost their money, and they're asking for help. How often do you hear from people like that, and how bad? how bad is it? Like what's the worst case yeah. you've heard? Um, I'm trying to recall the exactly what I, I think a lot of it. Um, some of the worst instances have been just people losing, losing their wallets. So like a common one is, oh, you know, years ago I got Bitcoin and I put it on my phone. And uh, I, I downloaded the app again and it's not there. Ooh, I'm like, did, oh, did you back it up? No backup, right? Or I did back it up. I don't remember where it is. Well, sorry, man. Like there is literally no recovering that unless you find that backup. And, and so I think the worst one I ever heard was um, a guy and his mother both had Bitcoin from years ago. He still had his... Um, and his backup and he had access to it, but then, and he didn't fully understand exactly what was going on. Um, but then he, he gave me a call and was like, so my mom had Bitcoin too. And, uh, we did write it down. I can't quite recall what we did with it, but she's moved since then. Um, and then her phone, like she has a new phone and I'm, and like, it was five figures somewhere in there that would have been in there. So, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And, 
and he's like, I don't know if I have the heart to tell her what happened. Like, and I'm like, that that's it's just what it is. That's unless you find that backup because like a, a new phone, like if you have the old phone, maybe, but like, he's like, no, I don't, I don't have it. Well, unless you find that backup, that money is literally lost forever. Like not only will you never get it, but nobody will ever get it unless they happen to come across that, that backup that you wrote down. So, you know, those, those are the most heartbreaking ones where people were, where they, they had Bitcoin, they didn't realize how much it was worth. Then they realize how much it was worth. And so they've got all these, these, these grand plans in their head of what they're going to do with it. And then it, it all comes crashing down when they realize they just don't have access anymore. Do not get out over your skis. We have a guy we work with in 2017 when we kind of a small group of us kind of started to grok all of this stuff and we were playing with shit coins. We're doing all kinds of stuff, but I created a paper wallet, showed him how to create a paper wallet. He created one, put, I don't remember how much Bitcoin, a substantial amount for a first foray into Bitcoin onto this paper wallet and put it in his car, cleaned his car out and gone. The paper wallet disappeared. He probably vacuumed it up by mistake or something. But yeah, it's uh, it's a hard lesson, man. Is yeah, yeah. And uh, by the way, if anyone's listening, don't do paper wallets, especially not these websites, yeah. because most of them are compromised, and you'll probably lose your money. Mm-hmm. Someone else steal it. So don't use those. Yeah, I, I worked at a Bitcoin ATM company, and um, uh, I don't know if it. I don't think they do this anymore, but there was a couple, uh, there's a couple horror stories. One was a, a, a save, like a close save, um, where some kid for the first time came down with like a few hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or something. And he's like, I'm going to get Bitcoin. And he put Bitcoin into the ATM and, uh, and then it like, he didn't have like a wallet on his phone. And so he, he didn't understand exactly what was happening, but he like, I think he put like that said, Oh, do you want us to like email you a receipt or something like that? And so he did that portion. But then if you don't have a wallet that you scan, it spits out a paper wallet for you with the funds on it. He thought that was just a secondary receipt and he just dropped it in the trash and walked away. (laughs) He came back later being like, I don't, where's my Bitcoin? And he had like just a receipt that just had like the amount on it and not the paper wallet. We're like, well, did, do you have the the paper wallet that they, like you didn't scan a phone. He's like, I don't know. I threw a piece of paper out. We scoured the trash and found it <laughs> and he was saved. But had we not like, you know, had the trash been cleared, it would have been gone forever. But at the same, um, there's other ATM companies that those paper wallets, they were, um, they were printed on that thermal paper. And so if you leave them for long enough, if you don't clear it out into a wallet that you have access to over time, that the quality of the paper may degrade. And so there's been a few close calls where I've assisted people where they're like, you can't scan the private key, but you can just hopefully decipher the actual like printed. And so it was like typing out, like testing a couple different letters and then getting access to the funds. But it's yeah (laughs) there's been some scary ones damn this is the hard part is it's you want to tell everybody to take self-custody but plain and simple if someone's not ready they're not freaking ready man i mean i know of a relationship of someone that's just like they don't really they have bitcoin because i basically insisted that they get it because i love and Mm -hmm. care for this person but they still haven't taken any personal ownership of it and i'm like i'm not going to self-custody it for you i've recommended over and over to do it they're like, ah, whatever. I'm like, you know what? I guess it's better to just leave it on the exchange then. Like if you're not going to take any self-ownership, I think yeah. as much as some people knock on these solutions, I mean, I'm at this date and time, I'm I'm a huge fan of the unchains and casas of the world for, for a certain yeah. subset of people because this is an opportunity to get really robust custody solution with your hand held the whole way. Mm-hmm. Um, and these vaults, I mean... Right now at Unchained, like you can have one of these vaults for free. You have to pay a little bit for the yeah. concierge onboarding. But um, yeah, like I had a buddy the other week who's a um, wealthier individual who's thinking about taking a, a position. And I'm like, the first place I sent him, I'm like, just go to Unchained, man. It's a, it's the yeah. 
in a, in a way right now, it's the best of both worlds. What are your thoughts on those platforms? Uh, to to be honest, I know that there's some people that listen to this that are super against this kind of thing because there's a trade off associated in that Unchained or Casa or whatever the the solution um, is. They they know right. what's in there, yeah, but they don't have access to it. They just have a single key out of multiple keys. Um, but in the context of if you die. Is your family going to understand what to do when you think about, let's say a, a two of three multi-sig with Unchained, right? Let's, let's talk about that situation. So in this instance, Unchained has a single key and they have the coordinator set up, meaning that they can, can see the multi-sig wallet. They can see what's in it, but they cannot move it by themselves. They cannot touch your funds. They just, they just see it and they hold a copy of things um, as, as a last resort. You, alternatively, have two of the three keys. You only need two of them to move the funds. You can also export the setup into their free and open source caravan, if you so choose. You can export it to a variety of other um, uh, multi-six setups. And you can move your funds without them at any time, even without their software. If and, and in this instance, you would have two devices but you'd also probably have a backup of each device, right? And so maybe you have a device at home, maybe you have a device in a safety deposit box, and maybe you have each backup with a different family member. If anybody gets a hold of any one of those single things, they get nothing, nor do they even know that it's associated with a multi-sig. And on top of that, you could lose 75% of those things and still be okay and even in the event of your death and your family losing 75% of those things, they could go to Unchained with a death certificate showing that they're the next of kin and then Unchained with the proper documentation could then say, yes, we will assist you through and sign the other part of this transaction to safely move those Bitcoin to a place that is better. So like that, that's just kind of, that's a, a colossal amount of idiot proofing mm-hmm. uh, on part of people that may have never interacted with Bitcoin. And I'm talking about family members there. So I, that's, that's a massive service. Yeah. Hey, I have a like, question for you about this and I've thought about mm-hmm. this and I don't know the answer. So I think maybe you will. So if you have a multi-sig and say one of your devices takes a shit on you, so you need mm-hmm. all of the seed key backups for each of the devices. Plus you need the X pubs in order to reconstitute that to move the funds, correct? So if one, okay, uh, outline that scenario. So I'm just saying, um, let's say you lose two of the three devices, but you still have the backup keys. So in order to move those funds, you can't just use two of the keys. You're going to need to use all three, all you have to use all the seed words from all of the devices. Is that correct? In order to move those funds? Um, no, you could still have, if you still have the coordinator set up, which is a file. Um, so it's, it's, let's think of it this way. Okay. When you make a multi, when you make a multi-sig vault, um, and let's exclude, a, 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 a coordinator with this, let's exclude unchained and Casa. Let's say you're doing it by yourself. When you make a multi-sig vault and let's say it's a two of three. So you have three possible keys. You need at least two of them to successfully sign a transaction to be sent. When you create that vault, you use bits of information from each device Mm -hmm. to create a map to your digital vault. Okay. So let's say you had a, a treasure, a ledger, and a cold card. You get a little bit of info from the, the, uh, public key of the, treasure, a little bit of info from the public key of the ledger, a little bit of info from the public key of the cold card. You put all that together and that creates a map that tells you this is your multi-sig vault and that you only need two of those keys to unlock it. This is a file. This file can be used in a variety of different pieces of software. You could probably use an inspector or sparrow or, you know, caravan um, in a lot of different things. If you have that file, um, all you need alongside that file is two of the keys. 
Okay. Okay. At any one time, what happens is if you lose that file, then you need all three keys oh, to recreate right. that map. Gotcha. So I yeah, gotcha. that's why, because yeah. I've understood that you need to have all your backups. Otherwise you could be potentially screwed if you lose the, the X pubs, which would be the directions on where on the blockchain these Bitcoins reside. Yeah. So that's yeah. why. I, yeah. So no, go ahead. If, if you have, if you have that file loaded into um, say like Sparrow wallet on a computer, but then you have that file also loaded into Spectre on another computer or whatever it may be that it's called a, your coordination setup, your multi-sig coordination setup um, that file uh, as long as it exists somewhere and you have access to it, then you'll only ever need two keys. But in, in the absence of that file, you effectively don't know where the money is. And so you need to recreate that map with the three pieces that created it in the first place. So let's just say you're somebody who trusts that Un Unchained is going to protect that file for you and that you're doing this multi-sig. Yeah. If they had some catastrophic loss of that file, you could potentially be totally screwed if you didn't save that. Well, yeah. So when you set up with Unchained, uh, you download that file as well. You should you keep it. Yes. Yeah, you should. Yes. So so like in the instance of that, you, you may want to um, download it and put it on an SD card or on a computer or in cl even in cloud storage, just like encrypted or, or whatever you want to do. But worst case scenario, wherever that file may be, if somebody gets a hold of it, the worst thing that could happen is they could audit how much is in, in the setup, but they wouldn't be able to access it. They gotcha. wouldn't be able to spend it. Okay. Yeah. I think it is worth noting that if you are opening like a vault with say Unchained, you need to download that file. I've gone through that process. Yeah. I have a vault there. I didn't go through the concierge process, did it myself. It's available, but it's not like telegraphed that you need this. And I, I think during the concierge process, they kind of work through this. But if you are someone that's more of like in the middle with your abilities here, just remember to to grab that file because of the reason Josh just highlighted. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely an important step of of that, and um, it's never a bad idea to uh, I'd say download that file and maybe even try loading it up into Caravan or or loading it up into into something that's free and open source. Uh, to just see that you can see your balance and, and access it if you need to. Good advice. Let's transition here and talk about the dip we're experiencing. And uh, maybe we'll title this section, Why Are You Still Bullish? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think this is an important time right now, though, You know, for our listeners. I think a, we have a lot of hardened hodlers, but we ha probably have some beginners that have entered in 2020 or 2021. And... Are, are some plebs that are a little puckered right now or what is that block clock showing? I don't know what you got back there. I think we're in the upper forties tonight. Moscow time. High 48. of 69 K. Uh, what are you feeling right now? Sessions? What, what's your vibe here? I mean, you know, it, it's sideways. I get like, it's, I'm not, too miffed about it um you know it's it's nice when it's going up but also you can stack more sats when it's sideways or or dipping or whatever but it's important to people for people to recognize that this is in terms of price movements and dips and sizes of dips this is relatively par for the course like this is yeah. not too outside of the ordinary it does seem like um the things are extending in terms of like the, 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 the cycles, if you ascribe to a kind of a four year cycle idea, it seems like the bull portion of that seems to be slower and lengthening, um, over time, but we will see if that plays out. So like in the previous, let's say 2013, like the culmination of that and, and also you should probably think in terms of when the actual having happened, like when the, the cut in new issuance is, was cut in half. Um, in, in that context, uh, the first bull market of 2013, uh, happened much quicker than the, the bull market from the next having in 2017, that one took longer to, to kind of come to full fruition. And it seems, you know, if if we were to extend and actually have 
um, the bull market extend into 2022, that would kind of be a continuation of these bull markets extending. Now, I don't know. Is that going to happen? Is it going to play out like that? I don't know. No, if anybody tells you they for sure know what's going to happen with Bitcoin, then, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, that's a train you um, want to step in front of calling on. Any yeah, of yeah, exactly. But, you know, I, I think it's not outside of the realm of possibility that we're just seeing kind of lengthening bull markets and then shorter equally violent bear markets that just you know you you get your drop and then it comes back i wasn't expecting the the run that we had in 2019 i wasn't expecting us to be hitting like 12 13k in 2019 i was think i was thinking that was going to be kind of a pretty sideways or crappy year and then it ended up being you know there was some excitement in the middle of the year that i, I didn't see that coming um I also didn't expect us to hit, you know, 50, 60 K that early in the year this year. Yeah. We came out the gate hot. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we broke new all time highs and then within a couple of weeks we were doubling previous all time highs. And that's, it's not exactly how the 2017 bull run went. Not exactly. It took a little bit longer than that. Um, but because of that, we we also had something that we didn't previously experience, which was a, a 50% drawdown and and a kind of a sideways crab market for a big portion of this year. So I think for those that are are like, oh no, what's happening? Why, you know, there's a dip. First of all, in the context of Bitcoin dips, this is this is dick all. So, you know, <laughs> relax. <laughs> Calm your tits there. Um, but also like you need to get more into the why and the how of Bitcoin mm, because preach. as you, yeah, exactly. As, as you understand it, as you kind of go through the previous FUD points and then you see that we've experienced them all before. And then you also juxtapose the unwavering, incredible base uh, of Bitcoin that sets this precedent for sound immutable money juxtapose that against the you know the the money printer go burr culture of today it's i mean do you, do you need anything more than that like this is it this is this is the past two years have never given more headlines to point to than to say this is why bitcoin exists and just because it's not going up in a straight line doesn't mean that it's not trending in the right direction. So, you know, when in doubt, zoom out, relax, and, uh, you know, read some more. Yeah, people just have no ability to take a breath and look at the longer term. Yeah. And they want everything. I mean, everyone's got this high time preference. You know, they want things to happen yeah. right now. They want to be rich right now. Like if, and and also, by the way, if you're, if this, if you think this is just going to make you rich really quickly, like you should probably go buy Dogecoin. Like that's where you need yeah. to be or go buy AMC or something. Cause, um, yeah, there's actual substance go going on here. Yeah. This isn't, yeah, this is not a casino. Yeah. There's a, there's a distinct difference between trying, trying to gamble to get more dollars versus saving to earn more Bitcoin. Right. Like it's the, the time preference is so different across and and I I hate it when people just lump Bitcoin and crypto together and then loop in like Wall Street bets and all of that crap. That is peak fiat is crypto and and like aping into AMC or something like that. That is peak symptom of the problem, which is central banking debasing our currency. So we have to gamble just to have a hope of making it to a retirement. Bitcoin is literally like, it's so weird because it's just, it's in there with everything and everybody thinks it's the same. It's, it couldn't be more different. It's the solution to the problem and it's hiding in plain sight as, as a get rich quick scheme, but it's the opposite. And, and when you wrap your head around that and you realize one, I just need to, first of all, do something that I'm good at and create value for others and two, spend less than I earn, I can actually store my value 
not only for my lifetime, but I can store it for future generations. And, and this is the disconnect. People aren't getting that. They're thinking, oh, I'll buy this and I'll make some, make some quick bucks. And then they see because Bitcoin is not, you know, 100xing in a few weeks so that they can flip it for dollars, they go, well, I'll, I'll go buy Doge or I'll go buy whatever, you know, meme coin is out there or I'll, I'll do some ridiculous DeFi thing and get rug pulled. Like <laughs> this is the, the line of thought that people are going down, but the people that get it and have patience, they zoom out and they go, no. Do what I'm good at. You guys are a perfect example because you're like, we're we're not working in Bitcoin. We're, we have our day jobs. We, in, we love Bitcoin and we're able to do what we're good at, earn money for what we're good at. We've specialized in a skill and just save and put it in Bitcoin as our savings mechanism to save the fruits of our labor, to preserve it for to delay gratification till later. And well, that's, uh, that's what it is. I want to double back to your comment about what we call Bitcoin camouflage, where you have all these shit coins and mean stocks uh, hiding behind the same bush as this vicious monster. Um, the thing that I think a lot of well-educated, intellectually curious plebs have to understand is that there still is a lot of buffoonery in Bitcoin. Like we talk about there being concrete at the base and styrofoam at the top. And you have to realize that there are a lot of mouth breathing basement dwelling idiots who own Bitcoin and Dogecoin and AMC. And so speaking to bull markets in particular, like part of the reason you see these massive cutoffs and these parabolic balloons is that this is Bitcoin price discovery. And you're seeing a lot of that styrofoam get burned off the top. Like in this market, when this thing cuts off, you're seeing speculators and leverage traders get totally fucked. And then <laughs> strong hands are buying, the floor moves up, new people come in. You're testing the lower limits of where the substance is. So yeah. I think that's part of these cutoffs. I, in this kind of like sadistic way, I think most plebs will agree. These, these uh, cutbacks are exciting because you know that they're what makes hodlers. Like this is the moment in the relationship. Oh, yeah. This is the first fight in the relationship where you're deciding this is, this is, is this girlfriend Bitcoin, Bitcoin masochism is what this is. Yeah. When you just enjoy is, the pain. Is this girlfriend <laughs> yeah. pure infatuation or is there something here? Is this a yeah. three to six month trade or is this a 10 year to lifelong trade? And there's no way to work through that in your own head and exp than to experience these emotions and go through this process. Um, the only consolation I can give to people, I have never timed the market right. I mean, holistically, mm -hmm. when you zoom out, yeah, there's timing that's right. But in the moment, I'm always making the quote unquote wrong decision. I mean, even short term here, like the last couple of weeks, full disclosure, I, uh, I took a big bite at the apple around 57K. I was kind of sitting around... I took a substantive bite at the apple thinking that was an opportune moment. And on the short term, it wasn't. But hey, that's that this protocol makes you earn it. It really does. Yeah. My entire first year in Bitcoin was was an inopportune moment, quote unquote, until it wasn't, right? Yep. <laughs> like, that's 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 all it is. It's funny with the with the leverage traders and 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 the liquidations that we see. So like be, people that are listening that may not be familiar, like you're, you're basically borrowing, you're borrowing dollars, uh, against your Bitcoin using your Bitcoin as collateral to purchase more Bitcoin. Right. <laughs> and, That's and crazy. so what ends up happening is you can get these big swings. And so when the, the, value of your collateral drops below a certain threshold, then you either need to add more collateral or sell your Bitcoin to, to bring it back to a proper level. And so people get overzealous. They think they know the direction that this thing is heading. But as soon as they make that bet, you, you know, you can see it in the order books, you can see it on these exchanges and people know that, well, if I push the price in this direction, these people are all going to get liquidated and they're going to have to sell their corn to me super cheap. Well, that's pretty enticing. And so like you'll see it. And, and 
part of me, I feel for people because like I saw somebody on Twitter the other day and they're like, listen, I, I learned a pretty tough lesson the other day. I lost like one point something Bitcoin. I got liquidated and he shared a screenshot and everything. And you hear things like that and you're like, oh, that's tough. But, you know, Bitcoin is is a harsh teacher and uh, it, it 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 doesn't it doesn't care for your feelings. It'll teach you that lesson right off the bat. But on the other hand, some some days when I wake up and I see these cascading liquidations and like a billion dollars is wiped out and I see the price tank, you know, I look at the chart and like part of me is I'm like, okay, great. Well, you know, I've got some invoices coming and everything. But the other part and the this like vitriol in the back of my brain, I'm like, you fucking degenerate losers. I hope you all <laughs> yeah. get liquidated and wiped Let's out. Find you floor. deserve this. Yeah. Yeah, like and so you like you want it. You're like, yeah, just dump, wipe them out, fucking get out of here with that. Because this is the fiat mentality that we're trying to get away from. And if if we need to wipe out a bunch of idiots that are are picking up pennies in front of a fucking steamroller, so be it. Good riddance. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. That's like that's in the back of my brain. I'm like, good, good, tough. Yep. Get out of here. That's how this market works. Yeah. To think when when you understand that people are putting up collateral in Bitcoin that is getting margin called. So your collateral is dropping in value as your as your trades diminishing. So you're getting fucked on both ends. Like your collateral is just blowing up at the same time as your trade. So you're in a doubly bad position. Like it's an insane trade to get into. To 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 give an idea for those that have never seen anything like this. Let's just say you're doing 2x leverage, which like in the leverage game is pretty minimal. It's pretty responsible. Um, what that yeah, what that means is effectively um you're you're putting up one one bitcoin of collateral and you're getting exposure to the price fluctuations of two. Right? So technically you you owe one bitcoin worth of dollars but you have exposure to two Bitcoin versus worth of price fluctuation. So just for easy numbers, um, let's say Bitcoin was, was 50 K and you, you did two X leverage, you owe somebody 50 K you have two Bitcoin at the time worth a hundred K sitting there. If Bitcoin goes up to a hundred K each, great. You owe 50K, but the Bitcoin that you hold is worth 200K. So you you, you can sell off the 50K. You, you now own a $150,000 worth of Bitcoin. But let's think about the downside there. You put up one Bitcoin. You have exposure to two. Bitcoin takes a 50% dip. Your collateral is now worth half as much and usually you get you gotta you gotta have like fi- you know 50 percent loan to value i'd say on the shy side so what that means is your collateral that used to be uh that that used to be worth fifty thousand dollars is now worth twenty five thousand dollars and that means you need to deposit <laughs> extra bitcoin to get it up to what it was worth previously um, in order to make sure you don't get liquidated and Bitcoin can take multiple dips. Let's say you hit a bear market, you know, some of these bear markets can be 80%. So imagine putting in one Bitcoin, you get a 50% hit, you got to add another Bitcoin, but what if it keeps on doing what it did last bear market? All of a sudden you get another 50% hit. You got to add another two Bitcoin to that. Yeah. So what used to be one Bitcoin versus collateral turns into four pretty quick. So you, you got to be so careful. Otherwise, you're just your Bitcoin is gone. Mm-hmm. Okay, so just keep that in context there. Yeah, that's a very good way to work through the warning. Don't use leverage is the summary here. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. um, couple rapid fire questions as we wrap up here. Uh, they can be quick answers. What development in the last year has surprised you the most in Bitcoin? Um, I'm going to say, you know, a lot of, I, I'm going to give you through three quick things. Uh, the accessibility of nodes has been fantastic and the amount of cool applications that you can run on top of that is incredible. 
the growth and accessibility of the Lightning Network, whether it be running your own node or uh, non-custodially through a mobile app is amazing. And, and the ease of use of that, how much it has improved just in a calendar year is incredible. And then on, on the privacy front, also the accessibility of that and the variety of tools, right? You know, previously, uh, you know, Wasabi Wallet, but but um, Samurai Whirlpool being integrated into Sparrow Wallet, super awesome. Um, the, the, the use of PayJoin, pay to endpoint, um, uh, like BTC pay rolling out that, uh, blue wallets, looking at it, um, using that stuff like that in again, in samurai. And then finally, uh, um, on the privacy front, uh, kind of interesting also with trade-offs is, uh, state chains. So I, I played around with mercury wallet, state chains, basically, um, instead of doing on-chain transactions and doing mixes that way, actually using a, a coordinated setup to trade the private keys to set amounts of Bitcoin so that you have no idea that they've even exchanged hands. Yeah. It's kind of like a digital version of an open dime. Yeah. So you don't That's know really cool. whose hands those keys are in. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting shit uh, when it comes to um, privacy front, but there's just Basically, my my whole excitement is around the layers of built Bitcoin just being built out and becoming more and more accessible. And if they're moderately accessible right now, I can only imagine five years out how incredible some of this stuff is going to be. Mm. Who's influenced you the most on your Bitcoin journey? Ooh, that's a tough one because it, there's there's such an incredible culmination of of knowledge amongst bitcoiners and and people influence me in different ways um you know obviously like the 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 typical savadeen you know bitcoin standard kind of route um i've really enjoyed uh content from like any time guy swan does me the solid yeah. of of reading something that i don't have time to sit down and read myself uh that is massive and i'm eternally grateful for him but also for his like his own unique thoughts on topics uh, i think he's vastly underappreciated um yeah he's been on the show seeing, he's awesome we loved our yeah, conversation yeah he's i love he's the so diatribes awesome. he does um, after those too they're amazing. Oh, I know they're so good. It gets I'm already I'm already riled up from the article itself and then he comes on. And he's like, "Guys, you don't understand how important this is. Let me break it down for 20 minutes while I yell at you and it's and it's great." Um and then, you know, watching watching people like Michael Saylor uh go on and and kind of orange pill of a whole host of different people and then seeing those people integrated into their their lens through which they view the world is incredible. Um, but there's so many people that are doing it. Sailor is just an easy one because he, you know, he's in the media a lot, but so many people are, are able to, he has got a great way to break it down for everybody. I mean, and also the, the engineering angle that he takes it on yeah. is super interesting. As Foss yeah, says, yeah. he's a walking mainframe computer. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And if Foss is another great example because Foss opens this up to a whole new host of people that that may not have listened to um, the message of of some 20 or 30 year old some odd you know in somebody in our age range and then foss is like yo i've been i've been trading debt markets for 30 years listen to what i have to say and okay i will yeah <laughs> you know so those all of those people are just uh, absolute assets to bitcoin in their own way um, and not everybody hits the nail on the head perfectly in every single aspect, but they all contribute in their own way. And I think the culmination of all of that uh, makes, again, Bitcoin what it is and and helps people understand better what it is. Last question, favorite Bitcoin podcast? Well, I mean, obviously I'm sitting here with you guys. So, you know, what else am I going <laughs> to offer? So, yeah, it's a clear slam oh, it's easy. Here. Open and shut. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, out, outside of uh, obviously this this fine production, which I'm fully behind, and everybody needs to subscribe to and uh, and share and uh, all all of that good stuff. Um, again, Guy Swan always pumping out incredible content. 
um, from the greatest minds in the space. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people uh, shit on McCormick, but uh, he has <laughs> brought a ton of fantastic conversations to light. Having Brandon Quittam on recently, having Mark Moss on recently, uh, people like that, hearing those conversations that maybe people may not be deep enough down the rabbit hole to have stumbled across themselves. I think that's a huge service. Um, and uh, a John Vallis mm. just has this... Yeah this beautiful way of uh, kind of attacking the, the, how do I want to say it? Like he, it's, it's almost like he's investigating the sociology behind Bitcoin, right? He's, he's examining like the human impact and the, the human interaction with Bitcoin in a way that um, a lot of people don't. And I think that's a great thing to do. Ben, thanks for your time. This was an absolute blast. Yeah, this was fantastic. Uh, thank you for having me on. I, I'd, I'd love to do it again. We'll uh, throw this up front in our intro, but uh, give the audience a plug to you and your content. Yeah, yeah. You guys can find me on YouTube. Just search BTC Sessions. I do uh, typically a tutorial every single week, which I've been doing for five years running. Uh, I also do the news once a week. I do a, a, a panel show every Friday called Why Are We Bullish with a, a ton of Bitcoiners that just hang out and talk about what they're excited about. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm super active there, just at BTC Sessions. Awesome. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Enjoy Thanks. your evening. Hot on, brother. Thanks for listening into the show. If you enjoyed this discussion, be sure to subscribe on whatever app you're using for podcasts. And if you have an extra minute, go ahead and leave us a review. You can also follow us on Twitter. We're at blue underscore collar BTC. We invite questions, comments, and inquiries of any kind. And our email is blue collar Bitcoin podcast at gmail.com. We look forward to you joining us next time on the blue collar Bitcoin podcast.